What's up, everybody? Joey Powell here with you on the Coast to Coast podcast, brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity. Appreciate everybody making time for us this evening. Uh, Sherelle McMillan and Sean Moran are here uh, with all of the analysis that you guys crave. We appreciate you making us a part of, of your evening, your podcast consumption, uh, whether you're watching this live or on a playback. Either way, we're glad that you've uh, made us a part of how you follow North Carolina basketball. And y'all, look, I'm not even going to trip. This is going to be a great show. Um, I think there's there's a lot to talk about. Uh, we can look back on the game, but we can also reflect on what is now a, a final ACC regular season. I don't know how we got here this quick. I remember, you know, it seemed like uh, about three weeks ago, we were staring at each other trying to figure out what we were going to talk about. And here we are now looking forward to an ACC tournament uh, in Washington this coming week. Gentlemen, as we look back at last night's North Carolina win at Duke, uh, sweeping the Blue Devils and earning the outright, outright, with a 17-3 and conference record uh, ACC regular season championship, before anybody jumps in with any of the garbage, um, I, I want to point out, I know that the ACC officially recognizes the tournament champion as the champion. I get that. But I'm telling you right now, to win the conference outright, in a, especially in this modern era where it's a 20-game season, man, to win 17 games uh, and, and pull it off the way North Carolina did, kind of going from wire to wire, I don't know how you could dispute that and say that winning um, the ACC tournament is more impressive than that is. I'll get off my soapbox now, but the first thing I want to talk about is how North Carolina's floor burns set the tone for the game against Duke in which they jumped out to an amazing early lead. But I think it started with aggression, uh, excuse me, aggression and intensity on defense. Sean, how did you feel seeing North Carolina dive for loose balls early in that segment and turn them into quick baskets? I think it, as you said, it, it set the tone just one from the aggressiveness and in terms of how, how hard they were, they were going to play and how locked in they were from the beginning, but then to, to have it, turn into uh, a quarterback Ryan three-pointer, um, you know, was just, was gravy on, on top. And ESPN showed early on Shires, you know, inside Duke's huddle. And he was talking about who, who's been taking it hard to the rim, who's been going for the loose balls. And there wasn't really anybody at that point besides maybe McCain that could raise his, raise his hand. And I think we've seen it many times in the past where UNC has gotten down big early or, or Clemson and, you can come back, uh, but more often than not, it, it does. Ex you have to er exert so much energy to kind of get to the mountaintop that once you get there, it's pretty easy to slide back down. And we've seen it happen to UNC, but it was nice to, uh, you know, we've talked about getting those those big leads before and being able to sustain when teams do make the run. But I think that, you know, it wasn't just the, the first few minutes. Uh, you also saw Cadeau do it. Granted, it led to a, an open three, but at the same time, it showed that UNC was just a little more hungry and aggressive than than Duke was throughout the course of the game. Shrell, what jumped out at you the most about that first? You know, I know you're you're the guy that always watches games and segments, especially games of of great magnitude. What was the the thing that jumped out at you the most about how North Carolina set that tone early on? It, it was definitely the aggression. And before we go on, Joy, Brian Ives, former intern at <laughs> Uh, I see now works for ESPN. He's noted that the regular season championship is indeed in the ACC record book. So yes, it's for seeding, but also it is acknowledged by the conference. So all the people are saying, oh, it's it's just for seeding. No, it's recognized by the conference as a championship. So let's dispel that right now. First and foremost, they gave out That's a trophy. It. Like there was a trophy yeah. in right. the building. It's like, like right. not like North Carolina brought that from right. you know, J&B right. trophy shop, right? Like that's right. that's a real thing. Right. Um, but yeah, the first segment, uh, really the, the first six or seven minutes, uh, I, I'm not one to call games over when a team is up 15 or a team is down 15. But you could tell that uh, North Carolina just had a little something extra that Duke didn't have. And I think a large part of that is maturity um, because they understood the stakes. They had been there before. Um, and then, frankly, surprisingly, uh, most of us in media folk, I count myself included, didn't think Carolina was going to go in there and win. And if there's one thing that this team has shown, it's that when you doubt it, it, it will come out on top. 
So I think it was kind of a, a perfect scenario for Hubert Davis in that they were able to have a great win against Notre Dame. Um, and I think that Notre Dame game gave them a lot of confidence moving forward. They, they really kind of slowly built themselves back up from that lull that they went through, that three and three stretch, I think it was. Um, they slowly built themselves back up so that they're playing their best basketball in March. Uh, so I, I think it says a lot just about Hubert Davis and the program that they were able to get it done. But also um, the leadership of Ingram and Ryan, I think, is you can't talk enough about. And I'm not one who really probably before this year, leadership isn't something I really believe in as, as a concept per se. But I think their their energy, their their fieriness, if there's such a word, uh, really came through in those first few segments. I mean, it, Ingram had the first points and he had the second assist for Ryan's second three. And uh, Duke got, did get, eventually get it down to one. But like, you get down 17 to four, as, as Sean said, that's very hard to come back from no matter who you are. Yeah, and, and it was, yeah, it was one of those things where you got like, um, you know, old school players beating the new school fools, right? It, it was just Duke's youth, even in their own building, I think was was a struggle against a veteran North Carolina team. Yeah, I mean, maturity, maturity, it, what's the, I, I mean, if I'm misquoting this, I know I got it from Ted Lasso, but like the youth <laughs> is wasted on the young or whatever. Um, <laughs> it's 100% true because, I mean, they have no idea really the stakes of, of that game. You can talk about it, you can mm -hmm. hear it, you can read it, you can see it, but until you're in it, you don't fully understand. And North Carolina's guys, while it was the first time at Cameron with North Carolina, they've either been at Cameron yeah. before or played really, really tough games in college basketball. I mean, Armando has played there five times. <laughs> you know, so it to me, it's a, it's a thing where it was just obvious that one team was going to do whatever it took to win, and the other team thought they were just going to come in and win. Yeah, I mean, Mondo's basically got a parking spot over there now, and and you know, rightfully so, he's got a he's got a decent record against Duke, considering that you know, if if you would listen to any of the way that the tea leaves were blowing after seventeen, everybody thought North Carolina was was going to be going away, and that this was the last that that you'd hear of them competing with Duke's uh, Duke's you know elite recruiting level. Cheryl, I'm gonna throw a stat at you, and then I want you to give me some feedback. Fourteen points. 12 rebounds and 39 minutes from North Carolina's bench last night in Durham. Is this what the bench should be doing for UNC? It is it's perfect. I mean, it, it was it was literally perfect. You had everybody understanding exactly what they were supposed to do. You had guys making contributions. Uh, I mean, Seth Trimble was in the game. What's he in the game for? He's in the game to, to spell Cadeau. He's in there to attack. He's in there to play defense. And if he, you know, makes a, a shot or two, great. And it's exactly what he did. Uh, Jalen Withers, we talked all year, like your energy guy, your dunk guy, your block shots, your transition guy. That's that's who you are for this team. Whether you have aspirations to be more, you know, that's up for you to decide. But for this particular team, this particular year, that's that's his role. And he handled it perfectly. Um, Jalen Washington, short minutes, didn't didn't play a whole bunch. Uh, but when he did, he had I think he had the dunk that he got from RJ. Uh, so spelled uh, Baycott well enough and wasn't just a huge net negative. It was exactly what you would want from a bench in a game like this. I, I think Hubert Davis played it pretty much perfectly with his rotations as well. And I mean, I think last, last week Sherelle talked about can the, can the bench perform similar to what, what they did last time. And I thought it might be hard for Trimble to play at that level and ensure he didn't reach 10 points, but once again, he just had that athleticism and that aggressiveness that either matched or overtook what what Duke had. And then you talked about Withers, but every yeah, to your point, everyone played almost to the peak of what they can play in in those short minutes. So if you're getting that, I think when when they came in, in my mind, it was like okay, you know, they're probably going to give up a, a little bit of the lead. But um, you know, Trimble just was consistent. Sure, he picked up some fouls or McCain hit some big shots, but he played I thought fantastic on both ends. And then Withers just with those timely tip-ins both to end the, end the first half. Because once again, I think that, um, you know, to, to go up nine at, at the end of the first half, I think kept the momentum on, on UNC side. And then when, when Duke is getting that momentum, he, he was able to have another tip-in. So once again, can they do that every game? No, but I think that that's what you're looking for in a role. And, and really from one, one to eight, even one to nine, everybody now I think is pretty comfortable with what, what they need to offer when they're playing. 
and it makes so much more sense um, on the court, if if that makes sense. Like it it looks like a more complete product when guys go in and they know what's expected of them. What's the thing that you always hear about Cameron Indoor Stadiums? There's just so much energy and blah blah blah. I'm not going to talk about you know. I'm not going to go off on the nerds and the cosplay and everybody trying to be on TV. I'm, I'm going to skip that. I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, Sherelle. What I do want to talk about is that there's always this energy that is in that building. And what did North Carolina's bench give them last night? Energy. Like even when, you know, Seth Tremble, as Sean mentioned, got the ball and when he was going to the basket, he was doing so with energy. Uh, Jalen Withers' athleticism and energy are the things that he's been called upon to do. And when they bring that, it just makes this entire team look so much more uh, fluid. Speaking of fluid, I sure heard Sean Moran say many times, you know, about the mechanics of Cormac Ryan's jump shot when it's going in. Sean, there was somebody on a podcast somewhere that that was asking, you know, is is our collective view of Cormac Ryan as a shooter is that wrong? And he was he he was right to say so at the time because Cormac Ryan was not shooting very well. Last night I saw a guy that went in and absolutely was snatching souls, you know, wanting to send casseroles to people's mama's house absolutely just wanted to stamp his name in a rivalry and waited until the last game of the regular season to do it. Um, his line was absolutely just not from this planet. I'm going to read this to you. Eight for 12 from the field, six of eight from three. He's the only the second person in UNC history to make six three-pointers uh, against Duke and Durham. And oh, by the way, the other person to do it was Hubert Davis. Nine of 10 from the stripe. Uh, two rebounds and one assist, but you'll you'll kind of ignore that stuff when he's doing what he's doing, um, putting the ball into the hoop. Did you see this coming from Cormac Ryan? And is it just one of those things where he's built for this type of environment? I don't know if you saw 31, 31 points coming. I think, I mean, you could go back to when Notre Dame played Alabama in the tournament and, and how he did catch fire. I think when when you look at him from a, a whole picture and, and is he a shooter? I mean, over the course of, of Stanford and Notre Dame and, and UNC collectively, he's at 35, 35%. He finished the ACC as much as we've talked about his three point shooting, uh, just under at 37%. So 36.6, I think, you know, maybe the hope was that he was in that 38 to 40% range, but, uh, with how he's been shooting the ball, especially over the past, past few weeks, I think, you know, he's, he's comfortable. He is, he is a threat. You're not leaving him, him open. And I think so much of it is when he, when he gets his feet set, when he gets proper elevation, when he's not rushing it, uh, you just, it, it feels good. And when he hit those, those first two, he was open in rhythm, um, good balance. And, and you knew it had a good chance to go in. Even, even the one he caught off of, uh, Elliot Steele, when he had that heat check, the first three he did miss, that was more of a, a rushed one. And, and you kind of knew that might probably wasn't, wasn't going in, but you couldn't fault him for, for shooting it. And then I did love the the fact that they were running running him plays uh, to get to get some open looks when it mattered in those in those last few minutes. So I think in in general, did did we expect thirty one? No. Um, I'd say that one thing I also liked was him looking to attack occasionally. He got to the line, especially uh, UNC was was up one on the verge of potentially giving up the lead. He, I think he was the one that that had the free throws. Uh, so he was he was aggressive, and I think that's what you want from him. Uh, even if the three pointer is falling, still look to attack off the dribble at times. And once again, I, I think also just what he brings to the team collectively from more of the leadership perspective and the the fire. I think from day one, that's to me, that's probably been the biggest thing and most important thing that he's brought. And now seeing him start to pick it up because I, I think in terms of how far UNC goes in March, you're gonna look at whatever the last game is, you're probably gonna look at Ryan and Ingram and you know, was how did, how did they do if they can, if they can both at least be, you know, at par or above, I, I think UNC that that's going to help determine where UNC goes. But if one of them is really struggling, uh, you know, that, that, that could also be where they go. So it was great to see him play like he did. And I think we'll be seeing those shots for a long time when they're showing UNC Duke highlights. Sherelle, I can only jab at you because I love you and because you're our Sherelle. So we can say things like that, but in your defense, he was kind of hovering around the Mendoza line uh, when you made that comment about Cormac Ryan being a shooter. 
uh, after you listen to the post game comments from the players last night, it seems that um, Cormac Ryan might be psycho. And absolutely, last night he went psycho killer Norman Bates. Uh, man was losing his mind. Those last couple of shots that he hit were guarded and were like absolutely from outside of the arena. Sherelle, I'm going to give you a chance. Is this what you thought North Carolina was getting? Uh, not necessarily 31 points, like Sean said. We, yeah, I don't think anybody saw that coming. But um, is that what you expected to see? It was was his confidence and his ability to hit in rhythm three pointers when he when he committed to come to North Carolina for this this single year. Oh, well, the funny thing is, I don't think his confidence has ever been really down. That's that's the interesting thing. Usually, when a shooter is struggling, it's because they're either passing up shots or, or they're taking shots they normally don't take. They're, they're getting things not in rhythm. But I felt like a lot of his were, were in rhythm. He was just missing them. <clears throat> but he never let it impact how he was positively affecting the team. And that's a major difference from some of the players in Carolina's past who were labeled as shooters. Uh, they would come in, and if they weren't shooting, they didn't give you anything else. With Cormac, like, he still gives them a ton. So I think that's one big thing about him. Uh, didn't Like you said, didn't expect six of eight. But efficient, you know, 30. I think, Sean, you said he finished at 36% in ACC play. You'll take that. Yeah, I mean that's that's pretty solid. Especially you you weren't expecting Ingram to be to hover around forty percent the whole season. So in November, if you had said Cormac will shoot thirty six percent and Harrison Ingram will shoot forty percent, yeah, you you take that all day. Now how it happened is interesting because he's had he's had some heat check games and then he's had it, it really is in line with his career where you know there will be a a, a stretch a three game stretch where it's four for seventeen, but then there will be a three game stretch where it's you know, 12 of 20 or something like that. Um, and he's just, he's, he's on a heater right now. If you look at, you know, outside of the three game homestand, he's really started to turn it up from three. And I don't think it's any coincidence that UNC has started to round back into form from that lull once he started shooting better. So, um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you have to go through the fire <laughs> to come out the other side. And I think you're seeing him now come out on the other side. And like I said, confidence wasn't an issue. Um, he can, he's gotten more confident if that's even like possible. Cause he's a very confident dude. I don't say kid cause he's not a kid, but he's a very confident <laughs> dude. Um, what I thought was interesting and I, I'll get y'all's opinion on this is that, uh, if you looked at the bot score and didn't have names, you would see kind of got what they usually get. Like if you saw 31, from, six from of eight, from, yeah. yeah, 31, six of eight from three, you're like, Oh, RJ Davis had a great game. You saw 14 points and 12 rebounds or whatever Ingram had. You're like, oh, Big Hot was solid. And then you saw Ingram with you or somebody with nine or two people with nine. I think two people with six. You're like, yeah, that's what Cormac had nine, hit a three, made a couple of free throws. It was the same collective uh, stat box, I, I, I guess you would say, that they usually have. It's just that it came from different people in different roles. And that has been one of the hallmarks of this team, I think, from when it finally came together you know, last June, early July, was that there was going to be versatile pieces that, you know, could do a variety of things for the team, whether it be scoring, whether it be rebounding. I mean, think about it. There have been games where I think you could say R.J. Davis, Seth Trimble, Harrison Ingram, and Cormac Bryan have been the best defender on the court, not even anything on the offensive side. And I think there's games where you can say, and Armando Baycott as well. And I think there's games where you can say there's six different people who have been the best offensive player in the game, um, and I think there's probably five or six people you could say have been the best defensive player in the game. So again, to me, that says how versatile the unit is and, and how well they collectively mesh. So I, I think that's interesting. And I just wanted to get y'all's thoughts on that too. Well, I'm going to be, I'm going to go back for a second, but in terms of, uh, Ryan and, and the heat check after the Miami game where he went over six, he's shooting, uh, close to 46% from three over, over th pretty much through the, through the month of February. So can that continue over two weeks, three weeks, four weeks? Um, hopefully, but if it doesn't, I still want to see him being aggressive and, and attacking the hoop and and just making sure that that his presence is is felt. And in terms of the the team, I think what you just said, Sherelle, is huge because we all knew there are going to be games where, even though it didn't look like it, where maybe RJ is struggling or isn't getting his his open looks. Um, you know, same with with Armando. And I think when you go into the tournament, teams are going to be certainly focusing on on RJ. And if they have any longer, taller defenders, trying to, you know, run him off his spots. And and if you can get that versatility where, 
you're not just relying on one guy or two guys, then, you know, it, it makes a world of difference. And you add in Elliot Cadeau, uh, just with his ability to explode off the dribble and, and create, um, you know, create mismatches once he does get in the paint, create, create open shots. Then I think that that just makes life easier for everybody. And I was, I was definitely concerned over that last seven minutes in the first half when he got a second foul and, and went to the bench um, of how they were, how they were going to do. And luckily they were able to, you know, once again, keep it at, keep it at nine. But I think it goes to show that they do have so many different, different pieces and, and how well they did putting, putting the team together um, around RJ and Armando, but making sure that everybody, everybody has a, has a role and a, a strong role at that. I think there, the thing that gets me, Shrill, to your point about, you know, plug and play with the names in the stat sheet. I think the timeliness of it is what's a very beneficial to North Carolina because now as you're going into the ACC tournament, more importantly, the NCAA tournament, that gives other coaches something to think about, right? When you've seen uh, Hubert Davis spam uh, Harrison Ingram back and get smaller guys down into the post, or even in a sense of Mark Mitchell, who's not a smaller guy, but it was clear that he couldn't guard him. Um, when you see, you know, UNC's ability to run staggers and flares to get uh, to get their their three point shooters open, and different guys are hitting it. I think that's the the valuable part of about having the whole uh, roster show up at different times. I think that's uh that's really going to be intriguing as we move deeper into March. Shrell, you you mentioned Harrison Ingram there. I want to dig in a little bit further with with him, seeing what he and Cormac Ryan have done this year, and, and to an extent Jalen Withers. But then looking at what Hubert Davis has been able to do in the transfer portal as a whole, would it not say that future portal players are going to be beating down UNC's doors to come be a part of this program? I think they have a, a proof of concept, as, as we love to say in the corporate world, uh, mm -hmm. between Brady Manick and um, Harrison Ingram and Cormac Ryan. And even, even though the Pete Nance situation didn't work out the best. I think that was more about a positional thing than really you know, yeah. him not fitting in than, than him not being a great player or a good, you know, fit overall for North Carolina. Uh, but yeah, you, you can say, especially at the four, I mean, what, what more evidence do you need? Like Brady Manick was a good player at Oklahoma and at Carolina, he became like one of the best three. I mean, he was already a good shooter. Don't get me wrong, but his, his overall game, you know, improved at UNC. I, I remember, going back to uh, some of the podcasts we did when he committed and we were like, can he rebound? Like, is he able to do that? Cause he didn't show it at Oklahoma and it developed at UNC once he got into the system and uh, Harrison Ingram, you know, uh, <clears throat> a top 25 player who was heavily recruited out of high school was solid at Stanford, you know, pac 12 freshman of the year, but never at this level. Um, and that's not, I, I don't, I don't think you can just say, Oh, well they were in bad situations. Part of it was probably they were in the great situation. But also part of it is they got to Carolina and got into the program and got into what Carolina basketball is and got better. So it's it's a ready-made pitch. You combine that with the fact that uh, UNC, whether people believe it or not, is extremely competitive when it comes to NIL. You know, add all that together and you have, you know, a, a, a behemoth. You have a monster that you could create. Um, but the thing with Carolina is they're not just going to go out and take the top three most talented players. And I think that's... I, I think when you look at how Hubert constructed this particular team, um, you see why that's the case, because there has to be a certain attitude, a certain style to match how he likes to coach. And um, if, if we've seen anything, Hubert is very fiery on the sideline and Ryan and Ingram are in lockstep with how he wants to handle things. So And Manic um, was too. Yeah, Manic was too. So I, I think there's definitely proof of concept. I think it's a powerful pitch they have when the portal opens up in a, in like 10 days, wait, a week. When the portal opens up in a week, it's a powerful pitch they have to go out and say, just look at the results. Yeah. Sean, I want to ask you the same thing. When you were looking at how this roster was constructed, I think, you know, perfect world we saw where both Cormac Ryan and Harris Ingram would fit. Did you anticipate them fitting not only from a talent perspective, but from an emotional and psychological perspective the way that they have? What? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's always easy to play Monday morning quarterback, but I think we were pretty consistent that if they're putting that perfect team together, there's probably a little bit of athleticism 
that they were missing in terms of that that high riser or high flyer, but in terms of putting together from a chemistry standpoint and and every, I think going back to that last spring, every I mean, even even Wojcik committing was high IQ, good teammate, and can bring you know bring the level of intensity intensity up. I think Ryan was was more of a sure fact in that given you'd seen him at Notre Dame and you, you, you kind of saw the fire that he brought to me, Ingram was, was the big surprise in terms of, you know, he's talked about last week, always, always smiling on the court, but he's, he's ready to dish it any, any, at any point in, in, in terms of trash talking as well. And, you know, we talked about it early on in the year, love watching the huddles around free throws with everybody talking to each other, love watching timeouts, um, everybody walking back, walking back to the bench in terms of, just talking to each other, but, but also the bench, the bench coming after. And I, I think it can't be understated um, just in terms of how well the team has fit together. Once again, you had the two kind of star returners, um, older RJ and Armando, and then you were able to piece together um, with Ingram and, and Ryan strong, very strong players that brought different, different skill sets. And then finally the five-star freshman, the point guard, whose skill set fit exactly what was needed uh, to be the distributor versus coming in and wanting to be the guy and an average 20. Um, so right now, you know, things worked out, but I think there's always, you know, look back at the beginning of the, of the portal and Nick Timberlake was, was one of the the focuses. And I think in my mind, he w- he would have been almost at Wo- Wojcik role, probably more than Wojcik, but a guy coming off the bench. But if he goes, probably not getting Cormac Ryan. Right. So it's always funny to see how, see how things, um, you know, trans transpire as you go. But I think it was a great, great for both uh, the IQ and, and just the the chemistry overall. I I would add too, if you go back and listen, I think it was on his podcast, Justin Jackson, the very first shooting it straight. I think if I'm mixing it up and and not giving another podcast, he was on credit, then I apologize. But Basically, he practiced with the team earlier in the season, and his thing was like, yo, y'all need to calm down a little bit. It's a little too intense for late September, early October practice. And I remember him saying that, and I was like, huh, that's that's interesting. And then, again, you start to piece it back together. They've been this intense from the beginning. They all came from situations last year outside of Cadeau, I would say, um, that wasn't the best. You know, They all either were on losing teams or on the Carolina team that was number one and didn't make the tournament. So they all were like pretty upset, I would say, about how the season prior had finished. And then um, the finality, again, that, uh, one of our favorite words for Ryan and Wojcik and Baycott, they knew that this was it for them. And they knew that if they wanted to achieve you know, their ultimate goal, then they were going to have to do it with the guys that they had there. And I think that's been kind of a through line from October on, just the intensity and the togetherness of the team. And I, you know, I, I question it because it's coming from UNC. And of course they're going to say everybody's together and everybody's so intense and everything's awesome. But I think as the season went along, you saw it. Every time there was a lull or every time there were losses or, or tough breaks, like they always responded every single time. And to me, that says, you know, that's actually a team that's together. Because, you know, it, it, we've said it before, it's very easy when you're up 90 to 45 to be hooting and hollering and having a great time. It's very difficult to do that, you know, after a loss at home to Clemson and you got to fly down to Miami. That's, that's the hard stuff. And this team has shown that they're really good at kind of solving the hard stuff. So to me, it, it goes all the way back to that conversation in late September about the intensity. Yeah. I love that you used hooting and also hollering, man, you're tripping. Um, hey, listen, let's, let's talk about, um, let's talk a little bit more about, this North Carolina team's defensive uh, efficiency. You know, we talked about it earlier this year. Like, is this really what we're seeing? Um, is this really, uh, you know, is this fool's gold or are eyes deceiving us? Are the numbers not what, you know, what we're seeing on the court? And regardless of how you want to, regardless of how you want to parse it out, North Carolina, end of the season, number one in the conference in defensive efficiency. And that's just so weird to say, but if you look at it, the way they played last night, and I think, I think a lot of announcers parrot whatever talking points that UNC athletic communications give them before a game. 
It's their job. They have so many games to cover over the course of the year. Their job is to learn that team, talk about them that night. But I do respect when Jay Billis starts giving game analysis and when he's talking about North Carolina's ability to keep Duke from doing what Duke wants to do, knowing that Duke was number one in offensive efficiency coming into last night. That's where I start to really think, okay, this this is a real thing. This isn't just um, this isn't just uh, random, you know, bits and pieces. So last night, when I hear Jay Bill start talking about defensive efficiency, then maybe you can see it. And North Carolina does finish the season in conference play, number one defensive efficiency. Sean, am I overestimating the value, or am I overvaluing that number? Am I overvaluing North Carolina's statistical? defensive ability well i mean I, I think at the beginning of the season would any of us have predicted that they were going to be number one number one in defensive efficiency in the conference Def, definitely not from from me no, not a chance um and i mean you, you know it's funny to always look at look at um the games in at the the final point as well as how you got there and what was it the halfway point and we were talking about at this time i think their their rating was 80 <laughs> 89.2 or something along that line. And yeah. that was a top, top five um, ACC uh, defensive stat. Now, obviously they, they certainly regress, but they still led by close to four points in that defensive, defensive metric. Uh, I think we have seen games as of late where teams have, have gotten hot um, or been able to, you know, get to, get to certain points. But once again, I think it, it is a consistency. It's not maybe a, a true lockdown team that you you think of but they finished top 10 in, in Kempom um and it's a team that is very consistent yes there are some weaknesses you know in terms of the size etc but but they 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 get they're they're aggressive and they force you into the mistakes i think shire said it in his post game that and didn't fully agree with with the analysis i think he used the word they like to bait you into things but at the same time I, i'd say it's more they know where they're trying to force force people and if you're hitting contested shots great but once again they're they're acting as a as a unit which makes the world of the difference especially in the day of the pick and roll and and looking at creating creating advantages in certain situations Sherelle, i'd ask you the same like how do you feel knowing that north carolina finished first in the conference in defensive in defensive efficiency in conference play what's your what what does your head tell you versus what your eyes tell you yeah, my head still can't comprehend quite how it happened because they don't have the hallmarks of a traditional defensive team, like Sean said. They don't have, you know, a six seven guy who can just, you know, swallow up somebody in the perimeter with his athleticism. They don't have, you know, Armando Baycott is a very good shot blocker. I think that's an underrated part of his game, but they don't have somebody like a Derek Lively, you know, kind of in the middle who's gonna funnel every you can funnel everything to, which allows your guards to be a lot more aggressive on the perimeter. They don't they don't have really have that. So when I think about defense, I think about tall, athletic, lanky, you know, Georgia-born SEC-type guys. And Carolina just doesn't have anybody that fits that archetype or, or that profile. Um, so my head is like, huh, that's interesting. But my eyes see it. It sees how, you know, they fight through screens. It sees how they run guys off the uh, two-point line. It, it sees how uh, Harrison Egren can, can body people up. It sees how Armando Bacot has become really effective when he switches onto guards and just holding up for three or four seconds as the shot clock winds down. It sees how they grab rebounds. So it it is again about the collective for this particular UNC team because, you know, I still make the argument that I, I think the last year's team from an individual talent perspective is better. Um the last two teams I think uh, from an individual talent perspective is probably better. But when you look at them as a unit, it, it's pretty clear um, just how connected they are on defense, because defense is more about connectivity really than anything. Uh, so it's 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 wild to see considering yeah. is wild to see considering kind of our preconceived notions of the team and the personnel and all that entering the season. Like Carolina, North Carolina, finished with a top five defense in defensive efficiency, um, number one in ACC, top five in the country, and that's just not just not something you associate with UNC. So it's it's been it's been, it's been fun to see because I thought the offense probably would be top five and the defense would be top 25, but it's kind of switched. Sean, I want to ask you, uh, is, is, was the key to UNC's deficiency, uh, defensive efficiency 
when they started switching for like, you know, if you remember early in the year, they were kind of switching everything. And then they stopped switching for like one game. They didn't switch anything. And now we're starting to see where, you know, where most of this stretch for a majority of the conference season, they were switching on like positions. Do you think that was kind of the key or is there something else you would attribute that to? You're muted. Damn, rookie, rookie mistake. <laughs> um, I think, well, one, it was important getting away from from switching switching everything. I think that that makes you you lazy on defense and it puts you out of position um, on for you know for for defensive rebounding. I haven't minded in terms of what they've been doing of, of switching on the guards. And once again, that get, does go to to talking good communication, which they have had. I think there was one instance where it was missed um where they they didn't communicate luckily they didn't they didn't get uh duke didn't make them them pay for it but i think in general it is it just forcing contested shots um i I think we've been so used to and conditioned over the years that you're you're gonna attack you're gonna you're gonna get get a step and then once you start moving the ball within three four passes there's gonna be a wide a wide open shot and and you can just kind of repeat that and for the most part you know, you haven't haven't seen that. Yes, there have been been stretches, but another thing in terms of looking at the overall defense, um, when you kind of dig into some synergy numbers, they are in the 99th percentile in transition defense. Um, and I think in terms of how they grade transition, a little um, judgmental in terms of that, but there's close to 300 possessions on there, and and I think. Well, you saw yesterday when Duke was getting some steals and some some easy baskets. Um, you, you know they haven't they haven't given up those easy baskets for for the majority of the year, and they've been able to guard in transition. So once again, you're working in the half court set, you're working uh, to get a to get a good look, and I, I think it just goes back to that intensity and aggressiveness that they have played for or both played with on both sides of the ball, minus maybe uh, a variety of games in the last two to four minutes when it they, they've gotten to more of the, the stall ball offensively. But I think it goes back to the aggressiveness that they've had throughout the year just to get through, or if they are switching, communicate, and once again, forcing, forcing tough shots. It's funny for me uh, because just hearing everything you said, you talk about the, the energy and stuff. How many times do you remember Roy Williams saying he shouldn't have to coach effort over to his last probably four years? I mean, he, there were so many times he said it that it, it kind of became redundant. And you're like, well, what's what exactly is going on? And that's not something you'll ever have to worry about. Maybe, you know, that first five or six minutes against Clemson, they came out a little flat. But, you know, that's understandable. That's that's one of those kind of um, strange situations where they were incredibly high and had to play in a couple of nights uh, on the road. I mean, at, at home, against a really good team that was desperate. But I, I think that's interesting. That's a huge change. And then someone in the chat, I think, made a great point. They said what you guys are describing is called coaching, and that's one hundred percent correct. I mean, that's to me that's no, why no, no. Hubert I was, Davis. Sherell, I was told that Hubert Davis was terrible. I was told that they said that to me. Yeah, and I, and I think this is another lesson, and I, I don't mean to again. You know, I'm not on a soapbox or anything, but this is another reason why you have to give people an opportunity to grow into roles, whether it's you know Seth Trimble growing from the role he was in last year to the one he's in this year whether it's R.J. Davis going from a, a good guard to a great guard, um, whether it's Harrison Ingram going from, you know, being the guy at Stanford to being a guy at UNC, but still an integral part of everything they do, people have to have an opportunity to grow into what they are. And Hubert Davis was a first-time head coach, and there was a lot going on. The entire college landscape was changing um, simultaneously, like NIL and Transfer Portal all hit at the same time right alongside Roe Williams retiring. Like that's a one, two, three combo that no one I don't think probably has ever experienced. And he was able to take his first team who had an up and down first regular season. Um, they still finished tied for second, which a lot of people forget that first year, but went to the title game. Last year, no one's making excuses, not a great year. Retooled, changed out basically, you know, the entire roster and had a great regular season. To me, um, that shows growth. It shows an ability to change. Some of the offensive sets, if you talk to people who are more more adept at the X's and O's, um, the offense has already evolved from what it was just two years ago. The defense has clearly evolved some from what it was two years ago. Uh, one of the criticisms was his bench usage. This year, Jalen Withers played about 31 or 30%, 31% or 
of available minutes. Seth Trimble was right at 40% of available minutes, and he missed two games. And that is more than any other bench player has played, you know, in Hebert Davis's first two seasons. So we see that the bench has been used, which is was a complaint. So I just think it's a lesson for all of us. And I'm not saying Hebert Davis is going to be the next great thing. You know, coaching, coaching isn't even a year-to-year thing anymore. It's a game-to-game thing. He could lose on Thursday to whoever they play, Florida State, or um, who, who Florida State could Virginia Tech. Yeah. yeah, they could lose to Florida State, Virginia Tech, and everybody thinks the world's ending. That's their prerogative. But I think you're seeing the growth. And I think that's why you have to allow folks to, to grow into roles, to bring it all the way back. That's coaching. And that's why the team is better defensively than they were against you know those two games against Kentucky and UConn in the beginning of the season when they gave up 85 points in back-to-back games. And they changed things. And um, that's what coaching is, is to put your players in the best opportunity to succeed. And he's done that. I'm at some point I'm going to get the I'm going to get the folks that that follow the show to to understand don't try to apply a final product rating to something that's not a final product. Sean, you want to jump in on this? Yeah, when when Shrell was talking, I don't know, you know, a few words jumped jumped in my mind and not from the coaching but more from the individual players cuz when he was mentioning Seth Trimble, you look at a guy, you know, top top 40 guy you know, by your, by a sophomore year, probably most guys, Hey, I'm, I'm starting, go to le- the league, et cetera. And I, I think this team, I'd say maybe not ego less, but everybody, you always talk about, you know, doing, you know, for the collective good, working for the team, but I think it so, is so hard to to do and, and sacrifice. And I think we are seeing that really across every position um, of, of people putting the collective team before themselves. I mean, you have Harrison Ingram who probably thought he might be one and done. You've had RJ who, you know, he is putting up a player of the year um, season together, but across the board, you're not seeing anybody, you know, force the issue, take bad shots, um, be standoffish, things of that, that nature. And I think part of it is the coaching and, and kind of communicating that message, but also the players for actually sacrificing, which is definitely no, no easy task. Um, you know, especially at that, at that age and all the people, et cetera, that you have around you probably telling you, what you want to hear as well. Sean, you made a great point there. It's not that these guys are ego less, but there are less egos on the team. If I could turn a phrase a little bit, I think, I think that's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at. <laughs> Sh- Sh- Shrill snapping. I love it. I love it. Shrill. I love it. Um, guys, grading time. Give me a grade on this Tar Heel team relative to expectations for the regular season. Sean. I mean, in terms of that question, I think you have to go a plus in my mind and you pro- I'm probably usually a harder grader but once again three losses in in conference play two of those you know could easily could have gone gone either either way um so I, I mean in terms of my expectations thought they would do well definitely didn't anticipate three losses I mean even over the last five I thought they they might lose one to one to two so the fact that they're at 17 and three, I'd say also in my mind, I'm still very, very cautious uh, around yeah. this team, right? Because I, I even you look at the first game, uh, Virginia Tech, Florida State, like it's a, the, either one, I think, is, is a solid team and, and could easily challenge UNC. So once again, it is one game at a time, which they've been able to do. But I think when you look back, no matter what happens in the ACC t- tournament or the NCAA, obviously that slants everything a lot. But you're going to look back at this team and three losses and, and, I mean, it, it's simply pretty remarkable what they they did over a, a twenty game twenty game period. I mean, they only lost two on the road in the league. Like that's man, don't don't trip, Sherelle, Give me a grade. Yeah, I'll, I'll go A. Uh, ninety three, ninety seven is the same thing to me. So A, A plus, same same thing. Uh, just for all the reasons that Sean said. I mean, they were picked third in <clears throat> excuse me in the ACC in the preseason bowl, and they they. Obviously, did better finishing outright number one, uh, and I did not expect this team to spend the majority of the year in the top ten. Uh, especially, you know, when you left um, after the Villanova, after everything down there in, in Bahamas, and then they come back. They had a good win against Tennessee, but then those that Kentucky and UConn game, you just thought, you know, maybe this is a solid team that just isn't one that's going to play at that elite, you know, top five level. And then they did it for the next 20 games, or excuse me, for the next 19 games. 
Um, so I think we have a big enough sample size to say that this was a, a really good team. And, and in the larger, um, I guess, scheme of things, this is the first time since we've been doing this podcast, you know, since you came on, Joey, since me and Sean started it, whatever, years ago, that we're not talking about, well, you know, North Carolina probably needs another win to, to help with this or to help with that. The first time they've not really been on the bubble, the first time they've had a traditional, what you would call Carolina regular season, where um, they win games that they're, they're not supposed to, they blow teams out that they're not supposed to, they find a way, uh, the Carolina mystique to some degree is back. Like, I just feel like the program is back on solid footing because they haven't had a regular season like this in a long, long time. Um, you know, five and a half years, basically, since since Kobe and then boys, as Stephen A. Smith would call them. Uh, so to me, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, it has to be just because they've restored everything. They're, they're kind of back to where Carolina should be. And anything else from here, you know, it's kind of kind of gravy, I would say, because the, the grind of the regular season, to me, tells you more about a team than a one off in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, I would agree with all that. And, and uh, you know, for whatever it's worth, I'm, I'm kind of looking at A2. Um, I mean, I'm sitting here looking, and I feel like around week seven or eight, they fell out of the top 10. Um, but again, those losses were, with an exception of how you want to slice the Villanova game. I mean, uh, those losses were to the to top five teams. And you, know, you look at Kentucky right now, and you were kind of banging this drum last week, Cheryl. When Kentucky's on, they're absolutely like, you know, <laughs> Uh, NBA Pacific type talent team. Um, and then when they're, you know, when they're not, you got no idea what you're going to get. And UConn, I still think is is the best team in college basketball, regardless of what, you know, the AP poll says. Um, so those two losses weren't bad, but you're right, Cheryl. They've stayed in the top 10 most of the season. And for a team that was not expected to, I don't know that they got, maybe they got one preseason number one conference vote from, from the media. Um, you know, I, I don't know how you would look at this and not give it an A. Uh, something else I'm thinking about, guys, is, is as as we're grading things, I think Johnny T-shirt gets an A. Um, I don't know if you see what's what's on my head here. Hang on one second. This is gonna be this is gonna be great for radio, but the video folks will appreciate it. What you're seeing right there, guys, is. A brand new UNC baseball uh, team edition fitted from our friends at Johnny T-shirt. I stopped by on uh, on Thursday last week, went there and got a uh, needed an auto need a needed a panel basketball to get autographed for um, a business associate. They had that, and then while I'm there, I'm like, hey, they do have the new baseball hats in. They haven't had them in a while. They they were struggling getting them last year because of some logistical stuff with Nike, and they happen to have it. Your boy grabbed one. Y'all know my affinity for fitteds. Brand new, and I used my 10% discount off the top of it from our friends uh, at Johnny T-Shirt that you can get on the IC Premium message boards. So if you're digging the if you're digging the, the lid that I've got on tonight, you can find that at Johnny T-Shirt. Johnny T-Shirt's also running their uh, Our Blue is Best to commemorate the sweep and regular season title. Uh, you can get that right now if you go to johnnytshirt.com. Remember, use the premium code. You can get your extra 10% off of their already great prices and amazing selection. And if you're going to be up for, uh, you know, any of the spring sports, go by and see them. Tell them you, uh, you heard about them here on the Coast to Coast podcast. They'll treat you right, I promise. Um, they were, it was great to see them when I was in there on, on Thursday. So stop by. Johnny T-Shirt, we appreciate their sponsorship. Just really, really good folks. And, and we want good folks to connect with good folks. So we want y'all, the listeners and viewers, to go see our friends at Johnny T. Uh, boys, as we continue towards the towards the very end of this show, kind of cut juxtaposed with the end of the season. Does last night's game, and I'm trying not to be the try not to be like the the prisoner of the moment, as, as Sherelle always cautions me on. But does last night's game change how you see this team's uh, you know tournament futures, Sean? I think it does to to an extent. Uh, you know, in the back of my head, I've even though the the record is much better, I, I still have that UNC Texas A and M second round game in in the back of my mind. Um, in, in terms of, I was there live. I don't I don't need you to mention that. Thank you. <laughs> um, but in, in terms of who this team could get matched up with, uh, but I think if and and RJ wasn't RJ yesterday, but if they're getting solid performances from 
from Cormac and, and Ingram, which I think have been tough to come by together. Uh, once again, not 31, but I think they have shown, um, and I'll, I'll say one of these stats for the the two pennies, but between the, the Tennessee games and Duke games of showing what they can do against top competition. Um, you know, are, are they a Houston, UConn, Purdue, which once again, I think either all those teams can be beaten. Um, but it, it definitely maybe raised the ceiling a little bit in in my mind. Um, and I think we always talked about Elliot Godot and him helping to get to that ceiling, but it's really him combined with with Ingram and and Ryan in terms of what what the you know they're clicking like they are both offensively and defensively. It, we could see a, a long run, uh, but once again, if if depending on the matchups, depending on you know a team getting hot. Then you know, it, so th- there is still that that range where there have been teams in the past, especially teams that have lost two games, three games, four games in the ACC, that you felt these guys are definitely getting you know at least to the elite eight. But I think you, you know this team is extremely fun to watch and just trying to you know enjoy it yesterday and we'll we'll enjoy it over the next next few weeks, however long it it goes. Well, and I, I like your hang on, Cheryl. I, I like your point too, talking about um, you know h- how the matchups might go. To, when you mentioned shooting, I don't know that it has to come from Ingram or Ryan or Cadeau. Just if they get outside shooting from somebody just to create that depth offensively, I think it matters. Shrell, what's up? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm I'm curious, y'all's thoughts. Like, what is the profile of the team? Because I, I remember doing the podcast. I, I don't remember who it was with, but we were like, man, if, if they play Texas A&M, this is 2018, 20, the 2017-18 well, season. So they're playing, it, it was a m versus Nevada, and I was like, I don't know yeah. who's going to win win that game, but if it's a and m then UNC is in a lot of trouble. If it's not, they're going to roll Nevada. Right. Well, Nevada, right. Nevada had a better record coming into that game, if I remember. I, I feel like they were a favorite to that game. It just, nope. Yeah, it, was like a, it was like a one to two point spread, I think. Right. But it, it was like, you just saw, you saw the map. You saw, like, this is a huge problem for Carolina. Like, I mean, who is that? Say, it, it, or, or what is the profile of that team this year? It's like, yeah, this this is not good. Well, I mean, to an extent, same thing, UNC Wisconsin being being matched up uh, a few, you know, I think they probably would have fared better last against, year. Um, fared better against Baylor if they had made it yeah. in that second round versus Wisconsin. And then you had Marquette uh, two years ago. That that was the perfect matchup. So, you know, who, who's that team? I mean, I think we, we we just talked about Kentucky in terms of I how think, they yeah. can be at the top. Good but, Kentucky. Good Kentucky. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Or, or, but, but that goes, that goes to the athleticism. And the ability to create off the dribble that they had, um, you know, Bradshaw was still young, so they had that uh, uh, tall, that length. Um, which, once again, you look at Duke, you know, look at Duke last year. Probably one of the rare times I didn't think UNC was not the better team because they gave up so many games where they were the were the better team. They just didn't win, but a lot of that was lively, lively combined with UNC not having shooting, so they could just pack the paint because pretty much everybody on Duke is back, right? And their defense was just you felt UNC could get whatever they wanted anytime. So I think it is that length that can bother Armando um, as well as that athleticism. So I think it does go to the, some of those SEC schools um, that could, could be issues. Um, but Alabama, Auburn, nah, not types. Auburn, but like yeah, Al- Auburn. Okay. Al- Alabama, Alabama, maybe. Alabama, I could see that because they love, they love to push and, they're one of those teams too, where with their tempo, but, if they if they hit if they hit outside shots, I think that could that could be a struggle. I mean, I guess I'm I'm curious, you know. Once again, I'm talk Wisconsin, kind of the slow, methodical, um, even Iowa State. That which I don't think last year I thought Iowa State kind of they were the tougher team, the more aggressive team, and not that they punked UNC, but they exerted their will on on UNC, and I don't see people exerting their will onto UNC unless it is an extreme athleticism advantage. I think that's safe. Uh, Sherelle, I want to ask you, uh, ask well, you something. I, I, before... I'm curious, Sherelle's, Sherelle's take on that. I was, yeah, I was going to flip yeah. it around on him. Yeah. I, was, I just think I was, I, before you said Texas A&M, my mind was just like, Oh, that was in Charlotte too. And Carolina's going to be in Charlotte. So like, who's the, All right, y'all super... got to stop this, <laughs> stop this, <laughs> so stop like, this mess. So who's the super athletic, you know, seven or 10 seed, uh, if Carolina's a two or, or I guess eight or nine, if they're a one, uh, who could, uh, you know, kind of bother Baycott, who has the length on, on the wing to uh, bother R.J. Davis and then kind of 
see where things go. And you know, Bill Gonzaga, Gonzaga comes to mind because they're they're playing well recently. They don't have all of those pieces, but I, I think they have some of them. Uh, so there's there's a few teams, but I think it's more profile than particular teams that I'm right. thinking about. And there might That's there fair. maybe there's not a team that has the exact profile for this particular UNC team because as we said, it is very versatile, much more versatile than the teams of the last five years. Uh, so yeah. maybe it's a situation where they're not as uh, they're more immune to uh, that kind of talent deficiency just because they are yeah. so versatile. Well, they're not as susceptible as like this, you know, the the common prototypes of teams that you see out there, which, you know, every year it seems like there's a different style that seems to be, you know, uh, running the tournament or, or having success. Um, who knows what that'll be this year? Uh, all right, guys, last question. What do you anticipate this week in D.C.? Sure, I'll stay with you. Oh, man. Uh, I don't know. This is under Hubert Davis. I think it, it has a little that's going to sound bad. Let me rephrase. I think Hubert Davis, I think winning the tournament is very, very important to him because uh, it reminds him of, of the Coach Smith days when Carolina won the tournament often. And as weird as it seems, Carolina hasn't won one in eight years. And the last Which one, that was in D.C. Yeah. And, I mean, really, since 2000, I think they've only won three. Uh, the back-to-back in 2007 and eight, and then 16. I believe that's correct. So three in 24 years for an event that Carolina used to own isn't great. And I think you'll see Hubert Davis play it like the NCAA tournament. I don't think it's going to be a situation where maybe past UNC coaches are like, you know, cool. Uh, if if they win, great. If not, it's all good. The the big one is next week. I think he's going to play it straight. Uh, so I I don't expect there to be any lull on Thursday at noon. I don't expect the team to come out sleepy at all. I think that's uh, not in this team's DNA. Uh, it could just be a bad shooting night. But I, I think they'll win a game. I. I I really think they'll be in the final on Saturday. Who they play, who knows? But uh, I think they're going to go for it and, and try to get that double regular season ACC championship uh, going. I mean, it, it, I think you're right. I don't think it's in it, it, it. Who knows? I don't think it's in this team's DNA. It's definitely not in this coach's DNA. Um, I think he's like I you did, said. I didn't answer, is, and I didn't answer your question either. Sorry. Uh, you, you did. You said you know one game, but then you said you thought they'd they'd make it to the final. Um, uh, that's an answer to me, and it's, since I'm the one that, that's that's running the show, I'm going to give you a pass on that, sir. I think that's acceptable. Sean, what's your uh, what's your expectation for for the heels this weekend? I, to be honest, I don't I don't really have one because I think you can look at even the first game they play, whether it is Virginia Tech or or Florida State, if one, one of, not a tournament team in terms of NCAA tournament, and maybe even the semifinal isn't depending on Waker Waker Pitt, but I think all four of those teams could give UNC a game, um, right. you know, and then that's even before looking at the finals. So I think um, he, I'd agree with Terrell, at least at least one, see where things go. I, I think wouldn't be a surprise if they go and win it. Uh, wouldn't be a surprise if somehow they got upset and maybe that refocuses them on what really matters, the, the NCAA tournament. But, you know, I think with how they've been playing, um, makes me wish I still lived in D.C. and was going to the games. But I think, you know, they, they it's sh- they should be very competitive and, and most likely will be getting into that NCAA tournament. And maybe we're talking about uh, regular season and conference tournament championships next Sunday. Well, shout out to the folks who were in DC with me in, in 16 when the, the Tar Heels beat just absolutely throttled Notre Dame and then, uh, and then beat uh, Virginia to win it that night at Fado was, was quite fun. Um, all Sorry. right, guys. That, yeah, go ahead. That, that is one of my favorite none NCAA tournament games that final against Virginia that yeah. and the funny thing is um I we always said man that felt like a final four game like it was intense it was back and forth of course it was low possessions because it was Virginia they had a lot of NBA talent then and Carolina hadn't you know they were trying to get over the hump and they finally did and won it and just think about it they were 10 minutes away from having a rematch with them in the final four yeah but uh Jim sure. Beheim decides to go yeah. pre- decides to go press <laughs> on UVA and Carolina ends up, you know, blowing Syracuse out in the final four. We know how it, it ended, but I just always think about that year. That that was such a great game, just a, a wonderful college basketball game in, in DC that year. Well it was a cool environment. It was a high level game, but the environment was cool because you had both the UVA and UNC fans there. I mean it was it was split and there was also a couple of NC State fans in front of us who were just there to be mad at the world. 
But there was like, you know, there was a ton of uh, UNC fans, a ton of UVA fans. And to your point, Sherelle, that was actually a fun UVA team to watch. They were much less, you know, they were still the the stall ball teams like Tony Bennett's known for, but they had some players, right? I think uh, Parentes was still on that roster. Um, Justin Anderson might have still been on that roster. Like they still had some dudes uh, that are in that are in the league right now. And that was a that was a game where North Carolina played Virginia's game and beat them at it uh, because you know Bryce Johnson and, and and Kennedy Meeks and Marcus Page did absurd things. Uh, boys, let's get a couple of questions before we uh, before we duck out for the evening. Question from um, Brian Evans, my guy, Brian Evans. Uh, will Hubert give the bench more minutes in the ACC tournament to keep the starters' legs fresh for the NCAA? Uh, Sherelle, I'm gonna throw this to you because you just made the comment about Hubert playing it straight. Do you feel like he he maybe stretches the bench a little bit more or changes up his rotations at all? I, I'm not in his head, but I my guess would be no because he's like. Yeah, he was. He, he's like 55. He's like, I can get out there and play three games in a row, and then you're going to have four or five days off. So I, I don't think so. I think they're going to try to win a tournament. It's it's three games. It's 120 minutes if you if you uh, go to the final. So it's not it's not the end of the world, and I, they'll have plenty of time to rest afterwards. So I would say no. I think you'll see the the regular rotation unless you know they come out and beat either Virginia Tech or Florida State by like 40. Then you'll see some some resting. But if not, no, you'll see the regular rotation. Well, and I just hope that if they do end up getting tired legs, they don't start sticking their legs out in front of other people. Uh, Sean, question for you. Is it, and I know you like comps, uh, is it me from Frank Nitty, or does this squad compare to the 93 squad? I'll jump on this early and say I love where Frank's head's at because I said something earlier this year about Harrison Ingram feeling to me a lot like George Lynch. Sean, I know you hate player comps, but I'm going to ask you, uh, is, is does this squad does this squad resemble the '93 squad at all to you? <laughs> um, it, it is a good question. I mean, maybe maybe a little little better answered in a in a few weeks. I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, maybe the elite score with with RJ, um, maybe being being a difference. But I know you love the Ingram and, and George Lynch comp, and I think when we we went through that, was it had just gone back and watched that uh, Michigan UNC Michigan game, uh, which was which is, you know, fun, fun to, fun to watch and revisit the childhood. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, I think to me, this team is, is very unique. And once again, in terms of usually when they are a one or two seed, I feel I have a pretty good grasp on, on, you know, whether it's putting a, a few dollars down on, on them at, at certain odds or whatever, I feel I usually have a pretty good grasp on how they're going to do. And this one, once again, I think for me, the ceiling definitely has increased um, with what they have done against Duke, but you know, maybe it's the pessimist in me, but I'm, I, I still have still, still a little nervous to see how this, this one turns out. It's, it's okay. We'll allow you to be, we'll allow you to be a pessimist if you need to be um, good question, Frank. We appreciate that for sure. Um, Cheryl, I want to hit you with uh with one right here. Cause I think this is right up your alley from Timothy Phelps in the chat. And also, What's up to the 522 of y'all who have joined us tonight for a show on a Sunday evening? Love that, man. Give yourselves a big pat on the back. I'm not even tripping. I'm being serious. Well, uh, Timothy Phelps asks, Transfer Portal opens up this month. As we mentioned earlier, Timothy, it actually opens next week. Uh, do we, meaning North Carolina, go after a bug man? I mean, I, I don't know if he's trying to say Jeremy <laughs> Roach is going to transfer from Duke to, to UNC, but I would assume my man Timothy meant to say big man. Sherell, you mentioned some uh, some ideas and some potential targets uh, in the transfer portal write up that you did the primer on I C Premium about ten days ago. Um, I believe you touched on this in there, not necessarily uh, a bug man, but uh, I think you mentioned what North Carolina might be targeting, even if it's not an exterminator. Bug, I, I'm sorry, just deal with my on, on the aside. Bug man, whenever I hear that, Men in Black is one of my favorite movie movies number one <laughs> i just think of Vincent d'onofrio and the, he's a bug from outer space so when i hear bug man that's straight where my mind went and i'm gonna go watch that after we get off uh yes i think they will um what we have heard is that they're always look in it's a, a generic line but it's true they're always looking for game changers mm -hmm. and i think they're going to do whatever it takes and i think they've proven that they're going to do whatever it takes to uh upgrade and complement the roster for next season they want north carolina to be in the best position to succeed every single year and they feel like that adding a big man um to the rotation is going to help tremendously then they'll do it and i 
I do feel like they believe that. So yes, I, I would assume, uh, based upon what we've, what we've heard, that they will look at big men in the portal. And it, it doesn't mean they're going to sign one, but they will see what's out there once guys start entering their names, uh, assess the situation, you know, vet them properly, all that good stuff, and then move forward. Well, and you know, if if Hubert Davis is going head to head against somebody for a guy in the portal, you just hope he doesn't get Beetle, right? Um, boys, let's get to our last segment of the show. Thanks for the questions, guys. Uh, appreciate um, appreciate uh, Mr. Phelps there for playing along with me. I know he had a typo, but you throw a typo up in the chat, I'm going to latch on to it a little bit. Let's get to our, our two cents brought to you by Congruity. Y'all know Congruity. They are your solution for benefits and HR uh, for your small and medium-sized business. Look, I see y'all when y'all make the comments at me on social and on the message boards about, you know, about ads and 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 you understand who our sponsors are. I love that because it means these reads are registering with you, which means the next time you need something for your small or medium-sized business, you're going to call Congruity HR. You're going to visit them at Congruity HR forward slash Tar Heels and get that free business assessment. And hey, you know what? If somebody else has a business out there that y'all want me to talk about, Hit up Ben Sherman. We'll make it happen. We'll promote your business the same way we love promoting Congruity and, and all the other sponsors on here. Congruity HR, they're going to take care of the administrative side of running a business that you don't want to deal with. They're going to handle the HR. They're going to handle your benefits. They're going to handle the stuff that bogs you down and keeps you from worrying about um, you know whether it's your top line and income growth or whether it's your net. That's what they want to do so you can focus on what makes your business more profitable and helps it scale. Congruity, we love them. Congruity HR forward slash Tar Heels. Get that assessment. Sean, give me your first two cents brought to you by Congruity. First one is 71%. Any any idea what that relates to? Read that again. I'm sorry. 70, 71%. Is is that Hubert Davis's winning percentage uh, through three seasons? Um, I don't know. That's pretty know close. His, but uh it's the amount of time that UNC played what we're looking at as one or two seeds in terms of Tennessee and the two games at Duke where they had, like you can look at numbers in, in a lot of different ways. So I chose seven points, three, three or three plus possessions, 71% of the games or 71% of the minutes. So 120 Tennessee, two games against Duke, they had a seven point or greater lead, which to me is pretty, you know, the fact that they jumped out, and they, they kept these teams at bay. Yes, teams were going to make it run. Both Tennessee did and Duke did in both games at the end. But they really dominated the, those those three games. Two were at home. Um, so that was just something looking at, especially as uh, we see all this bracket bracket talk and who's going to be the one seed or, or two seed. Don't say the word. Don't you say that word. Um, I, I did see the question in the chat, and I did watch Arizona in person this week, but we can save that for, for next week. Um, you, didn't then, watch, you didn't watch them get their doors blown off yesterday, did you? Uh, I did did catch that after they blew UCLA's doors off, which doesn't okay. take a whole lot whole lot this year. But <laughs> um, second one is Armando Baycott, who once again I know I don't think we even touched on him a lot. Sometimes we just skip over Armando and, and RJ so much, even um, you know given what RJ has been doing. But Armando, uh, you know nine nine points, so you would look at that and say you know that wasn't one of his finer games. But I think with how aggressive. He was just continue, you know, the fact that they were able to, it's always talked about, hey, get Armando the ball down low, but he was, they got at the ball, ball down low. He was aggressive. Um, he looked to attack, foul trouble. You know, he, he, he I thought played a, a great game despite the the shooting percentages and the, the missed dunk, which has now become a, a common, common theme. And then if you look at the whole season, he had his best efficiency since his sophomore, sophomore year, uh, was a little bit down on offensive rebounding, but up in blocks, tremendously up in free throw percentage. So all in all, uh, you know, you know, I think he, he had an extremely strong year. And once again, the Duke matchup for him was one that he needed to take advantage of, and it's not going to show up in the 25 and 10, but I think in terms of the pressure he put on them um, was, was more so than, than something that shows up in the box score. So once again, it goes to matchups in the tournament and, and who's guarding Armando is going to be a, a big one. Yeah, I mean, he got a, a very key block that triggered that little run when North Carolina stretched the lead back out after Duke had cut it to one. Um, I don't think it was the possession where Duke had a chance to take the lead, but it might have been the very next one. But it was part of that nine to one run where North Carolina got the lead back out to a uh, 
back out to a comfortable margin uh, or, or at least an arm's length margin. Uh, and, and I think that's that's a that's a strong point, Sean. It's it, it's not like he filled up the stats, but the timeliness of his of his um, his defensive presence. And he really did make things tough for Duke in the paint. If you remember that first game, Duke had something like 50 points in the paint. And they didn't have that against North Carolina last night. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean was, even when uh, when Filipowski was going off and talking, talking trash, like he, Armando was making him work, right? you know, so he wasn't getting getting open looks. He was still working a lot. Um, and I think it goes to his defensive effort as well, which uh, it's never been a mismatch issue of of trying to get him in pick and rolls or get him get him in in certain situations. So I think really on both sides of the ball, I've been pretty impressive despite maybe some of the number, you know, statistical numbers being, being down. Sure. maybe, maybe throw over to, to your, your two cents. Yeah. I'll go ahead with my two cents from uh, congruity since Joey has appears to be frozen like Elsa. Uh, so number one, Roy Williams, 2020. And what I mean by that is the 2020 class was, his last class that wasn't impacted by COVID. And if you look at it, uh, of those players in that class, four of them are still playing in college. But in the end, once awards are announced this week, he's going to have that class is going to have uh, two conference players of the year in RJ Davis and Caleb Love. He's going to have two either first or second team All Americans uh, in Caleb Love and RJ Davis. If you extend that to third team, I believe Walker Kessler made a second or a third team. So that's three All-Americans. It's going to have a National Defensive Player of the Year, which Kessler was at Auburn. And then it's going to have two first-round picks in Dayron Sharp and Walker Kessler. So it's kind of ironic that, uh, you know, he, Roy Williams had his, one of his best classes in his time at Carolina and never really got to see it through because of the transfer portal and because of what happened with COVID and then, you know, him obviously retiring and, and passing it on to Hubert Davis. So that's number one. And then number two is 97, which is the number of three-pointers that R.J. Davis has hit this season. Um, been tracking that all year. It's been fun to track. And it's not an official stat because Carolina counts postseason in its record books. But uh, I believe, I'm pretty sure, please check me on this, but I believe 97 is the most made threes in a regular season by a UNC player. The players uh, immediately ahead of him or behind him, Cam Johnson, Brady Manick, and Justin Jackson, they all made at least 13 threes in the postseason, ACC tournament, NCAA tournament. So they weren't close to 97. Jackson was at 90 um, entering the ACC tournament, and R.J. Davis is at 97. So again, speaks to what I think is the best three-point shooting season in North Carolina history. Um, and again, that's why he's going to be the ACC Player of the Year. That's why he's going to be a first-team All-American, and that's why his jersey is going in the rafters. I know I've, I've said it before, but you look at the 65 in conference play, to Manic's 56 and once again I think if uh Manic had been given the the keys from the beginning it, it'd probably be neck and neck with him and RJ but it doesn't definitely doesn't take away what what RJ has been has been doing fellas I appreciate your patience um the bugs have apparently attacked my internet so <laughs> we'll uh we'll put a bow on on this year's show I'm grateful for all 500 and some odd of y'all who made this a part of your evening. If you're listening to us later on, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate you guys subscribing to the show. Remember, rate, review us. We love those. Uh, it also helps us in the algorithm so that we show up first. Would you like us? You want us to be first in all of your searches. Thank you so much, Jarrell. Thank you so much, Sean. Appreciate John Siegley for producing, to Johnny T-Shirt for sponsoring, and our friends at Congruity for sponsoring. We love all those guys and gals and what they do for us. Thank you all of y'all who have been in the chat, been active tonight. We appreciate it. Until next time, this has been the Coast to Coast Podcast for Inside Carolina. I'm Joey Powell. Did I get out or no? You're Joey Powell signing off late. Oh, my God. We're, we're, no, we're going to fix this. Hang on. I have no idea what's happening with my internet right now. This is <laughs> live, live radio at its finest, huh? This is the post game show. All right. Bueller, anybody? You're here. We hear you. Okay. Well, let me try this again. <laughs> I don't know where y'all lost, but I want to make sure I get a good out a good outro here for for Siegley to use later on. Um appreciate Sherelle, appreciate Sean, appreciate everybody here.
thanks to thanks to Sigley for producing the Johnny T-shirt and for Congruity HR. I have no idea if anybody can hear this, but I'm grateful for all of you who stuck around. We'll catch you next time on the Coast to Coast podcast for InsideCarolina.com. I'm Joey Powell. Take it easy.